Well, given the Athenaeum's origins, its history, and its location, it's uh, natural that we have a number of lectures devoted to subjects American and British. And I'm therefore all the more pleased uh, when we have the opportunity of presenting a lecture on, well, in this case, something very French. And we'll actually uh, be collaborating this evening with the WGBH Forum Network. So this lecture will be filmed, and of course there will be a book signing afterwards. Our speaker is Dr. Charles Kogan, who is a senior research associate at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He's a graduate of Harvard. He became a journalist and then a military officer, spending 37 years in the Central Intelligence Agency, 23 of them on assignment overseas. From 1979 until 1984, he was chief of the Near East South Asia Division in the Directorate of Operations. And from 1984 to 1989, he was the CIA chief in Paris. After leaving the CIA, he earned a doctorate in public administration at Harvard. He lectures widely. He writes in English and in French. His latest book, as you know, is French Negotiating Behavior, Dealing with La Grande Nation, which was published in 1903 by the United States Institute of Peace Press. A French language version of his book is going to appear next spring. Please join me in welcoming Charles Kogan to the Boston Athenaeum. Thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here in old Boston. This is not a Rumsfeldism. Uh, I might add that uh, after a long struggle, uh, there is a French version of this book coming out, and it is going to have a preface by the man who invented the term hyperpower, referring to the United States. That's uh, Hubert Védrine, the former foreign minister. I'm very honored by that. This book is the sixth in a series of books on how foreign countries uh, negotiate. It's sponsored by the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, which has a project on cross-cultural negotiations, has many other projects too. The first book was on China, followed by one on Russia, then one on North Korea, Japan, and Germany, so this is the sixth one on France. Uh, this is not a how-to book on the nuts and bolts of negotiations. The main emphasis in this series, or at least in this book, is on culture. That is, political culture, strategic culture, etc. And how this is a factor in the way countries conduct negotiations, whether diplomatic negotiations or business negotiations or others. A German diplomat whom I interviewed commented, and I quote, The French think that negotiation comes naturally that they know by their education what French interests are. They rely on the sharpness of their minds. They don't pay attention to procedural matters. Typically, senior French officials are likely to consider that having mastered at Sciences Po and the École Nationale d'Administration the codes that have gained them entry into France's elite class, they will be able to handle any situation. The French are less process-oriented, not only than the Americans who pioneered the study of the negotiation process, but also representatives of their fellow major powers in Europe, Germany, and Britain. In fact, there is no French word for process as we understand the term. That is, in the sense of its meaning in English, of a particular method of doing something generally involving a number of steps or operations. Christoph Bertram, the head of the German think tank SWP, whom I interviewed in Berlin, he remarks that, quote, French policy expresses France. It is a way of claiming one's identity. It is not to shape or change things. 
The Germans are interested in process. The French defend status. They are suspicious of process. The toolbox approach to negotiations is foreign to them. Sir Michael Jay, the permanent undersecretary in the Foreign Office in London, whom I interviewed there, sums up the British view on how the French approach the negotiation process. I quote, The French do not focus on process or on the interests of the country with which they are negotiating. They focus on the interests of the French instead. It is not so much a scientific process as an artistic performance. The British put themselves in the position of the person they are negotiating with. What is the best tactic, how to proceed, etc. This reflects an appreciation of how the other thinks. The French are not interested in getting inside the minds of others. In the course of writing this book, which took uh, two and a half years and which began in the middle of 2001, I made several trips to Europe sponsored by the U.S. Institute of Peace. I wanted to interview the principal actors, uh, obviously starting with the French themselves uh, and the Americans, the British, the Germans, and also the people around the European Union and NATO. The interviews were conducted with two purposes in mind. Firstly, to fill out my reading and give some uh, meaning to the theoretical chapters in the book. And secondly, to put some flesh on the three case studies which form one of the seven chapters in the book. Since the Institute of Peace wanted the case studies to be post-Cold War, I had to rely, rely largely on interviews. The case studies are first, the dispute in 1996-97 over the uh, Southern Command at Naples, which the French wanted as a, as a, as a uh, in return for their returning to NATO, which the Americans refused. Uh, the crisis that developed over the uh, effort to impose a new inspection regime in Iraq, which led to the war in 2003, which is still going on. And finally, the French efforts in 1993 in the closing phase of the Uruguay round to protect their agricultural interests and their cultural exception, particularly as regards French films. The interview material, in my opinion, is a unique feature of the book. Uh, I didn't get to the very top, or even try to. I didn't interview Jacques Chirac or Dominique de Villepin, for example. But I did get to a whole group of senior French civil servants. Uh, most of them are ANARCHs, that is, they are graduates of the École Nationale d'Administration. And I had some very good interviews also in London, Berlin, and Brussels. I had a, an agreement with my interviewees that I would let them verify my text. The interviews took place in the spring of 2002, and my editor was very good, who was Brit, uh, he didn't want me to verify the quotes until, I, they, until we had a final text, which didn't happen until July 2003. The problem was that in the meantime, the French-American relationship sort of went into free fall, and I was very nervous that uh, some of my interviewees would back out, but only one did. A couple of others made some changes, but they were not significant. I'd like to read a couple of passages from these interviews. The first deals with what has been called the French having to bear the burden of being right. For example, in the aftermath of the war of 2003 in Iraq, the French were left with the perception that they had been right. But their overall power position had not been improved as a result of their stand. The first quote is from Gérard Arrault a notably frank-speaking French diplomat who was the former deputy ambassador to NATO and now is ambassador to Israel. I quote, The French are prisoners of their Cartesian obsession. They believe in the religious sense of the term, in reason, and they do not see in their position the defense of their interests, but rather the expression of a transcendent reason of which they consider they have the monopoly. They sincerely do not see that as if by chance this reason justifies their interests precisely. 
Once the goddess of reason has been satisfied, they do not understand when a rational position does not meet with unanimity. When a French position, ergo logical, is refused or countered, the French are taken aback by what they consider to be bad faith or stupidity. When one is right, one doesn't compromise. The second quote is from Professor Rudolf von Tadden. Chancellor Schroeder's coordinator of French-German affairs, whom I interviewed his, at his university at Göttingen. He looks to the distant past to help explain today's Franco-German relationship, which I would describe as a strategic imperative overlaying a cultural mismatch. I quote from Professor von Tadden. France and Germany are like two brothers whose father is Charlemagne. Italy is like a sister, patient, indulgent, and not intended to be a rival, as are the two brothers. France was the leader in fighting for human rights and in promoting universal values, and in medieval times, France led in fighting for Christianity and was known as the elder daughter of the church. But France has two disadvantages. The first is that the second brother, Germany, got the imperial crown, the Holy Roman Emperor of the Germanic peoples. The second disadvantage is that the second brother is a little bit stronger than the first one. It is a drama that has been going on for 12 centuries. In the contemporary world, Professor von Tadden observes, things tend to go sour between the two countries when Germans forget or ignore the fact that the French want to be the elder brother. As Henry Kissinger, who was one of the people I interviewed, put it to me, French behavior is explainable by the country's cultural past and by its historical past. His observation bore out for me what I'd already decided upon as the structure of my book. This structure is based on the theme that these are the two strands which form the background to French negotiating behavior, what can be called the cultural strand and the historical strand. You can't separate them, of course, they're intertwined. For example, French political culture, which is very different from that of the United States, although they're both Western democracies, is based not only on what French thinkers have brought to the debate, but also on the history of France and the various turns that this history has taken. French political culture springs most importantly out of a historical event, the French Revolution, as American political culture springs out of the American Revolution and the Constitution that followed it. And though both revolutions took place around the same period, they are distinctly different, especially as regards the role of the individual in the state and the role of religion in society. The US model of democracy, argues Stanley Hoffman, is that of liberalism based on the thought of John Locke and other English and Scottish philosophers. I quote from Professor Hoffman, the word rights is at the heart of the American tradition. These individual rights should permit those that have them to resist the pressures of society and the state. The French conception is completely different and owes much to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Liberalism is at the opposite pole from absolute monarchy. The Rousseauist conception is in a sense a sort of reverse absolutism that substitutes the nation for the monarch. Here the key word is law, as the expression of national sovereignty. In the French conception, law is superior to rights, and individual rights can be restricted or suspended by the general will. <coughs> In the historical strand, I see two main elements. The first is the theme of la grande nation. Now what do I mean by la grande nation? This was how France was known at the height of its hegemony in Europe. Today we see a certain hangover of this in the way the French look at their historical experience. <coughs> Excuse me. But I also use the term 
to refer to the longevity and the ponderousness of the French state in comparison with the rest of continental Europe. France has had a functioning state bureaucracy and a functioning diplomacy since the days of Cardinal Richelieu in the first half of the 17th century. France was the inventor of la raison d'état. It flows from this pattern that the cooperation of a French negotiator with any foreign counterpart can only go so far. <coughs> in the words of Anlene Rocati, quote, it is doubtless in this ancestral conception of the state as the founder of the entire life of the nation <coughs> that resides the French specificity of which the <coughs> Anglo-Saxon countries are unaware. A French negotiator is very conscious that he must defend the interests of the state. An agreement can come as an extra. This recalls a saying attributed to Maurice Couve de Melville, who was the foreign minister under Charles de Gaulle, <coughs> excuse me, and for a brief period, prime minister. He's regarded as the master by the diplomats at the Quai d'Orsay. The following statement is attributed to him in reference to a particularly difficult negotiation over France's policy on agriculture. I quote, In the first 15 minutes, I presented the position of France. For the next 20 hours, I presented the position of France. In the 21st hour, I negotiated the position of France. The tradition of La Grande Nation brings with it a culture of authority that is a hallmark of French negotiators and that sometimes comes across as arrogance. Intimately linked to this culture of authority is what has been referred to as a culture of war. This in turn derives from French history. France was constructed bit by bit through a series of military campaigns, usually followed by the imposition of draconian peace terms. This has left its way, left its mark in the way the French negotiate. A negotiation is sometimes described as a line of battle in which there is no confidence in the negotiator across the table. The other element in the historical strand is what I identify as the culture of the underdog, which reflects the fact that France has had an extremely checkered history, and it reflects the ups and downs of this history, the defeats as well as the victories that France has experienced, including the most crushing defeat of all, in May, June 1940, when the French army was overwhelmed by the Germans in a matter of weeks, and this was followed by four years of occupation. Derived from this history of an alternation of fates is what Pierre Bréchon has characterized as, quote, the strong pessimism of the French with respect to their society and their institutions. The theme of France struggling against empires historically the Holy Roman Empire of the Germanic peoples, but following on with the British Empire, the German Reich, the Soviet Union, and now the American Imperium, has brought with it a culture of opposition to the dominant norms. This culture of opposition to the dominant norms is not only related to the role of the underdog that France has had to play following the period of its ascendancy in Europe, it is related to the straitjacket quality of French political culture and the reaction that has developed against it. As Pierre Nora describes this curious phenomenon, and I quote, France, by its history and its civilization, has developed a reflex of revolt linked to the formalistic and hierarchical style of authority inherited from the divine right monarchy maintained by a statist and bureaucratic centralization and which has invaded from top to bottom the institutions, the army, education, and business, and which has impregnated social relations down to couples and families. France, the land of command. There has resulted a latent anarchism, a dialectic of order and subversion, which is at the base of France's political as well as intellectual history. Also related to this culture of opposition to the dominant norms is the French feeling of being overwhelmed by the Anglo-Saxon world and of being in an outside position toward that, outsider position toward that world. 
This recalls the phrase of Philippe Burin concerning the French, a people that celebrates its conquered as heroes, Vercingetorix, Jean d'Arc. The combined effect of this dialectical opposition between la grande nation, the tradition of the longevity and the power of the French state on the one hand, and the culture of the underdog on the other hand, produces a sort of combination or an alternation between a superiority complex and an inferiority complex which is well characterized by the French historian René Raymond. I quote, Between the fear of decline and the hope of redressment, we oscillate, we move almost without transition from an inferiority complex that is denied by our unquestionable successes to a superiority complex that sometimes makes us unbearable to our partners. We go back and forth between moroseness and self-importance. In the cultural strand, in addition to the gulf represented by language, French and English, the French have a different educational and legal tradition, a different religious past, and a different political culture. In the broadest context, one finds a reasonably clear distinction between the French on the one hand and the Anglo-Americans on the other. This can be summed up in the contrast between the deductive on the one hand and the inductive on the other. The French method is deductive. One starts with a general rule and then one applies the particulars. This is a top-down approach. In the Anglo-American system, the approach is inductive. One starts with the particulars and then the principles are built. It is bottom-up. In the cultural strand, the chief theme that I perceive and elaborate upon is what I call the goddess of reason, a term that I picked up from Gérard Arrault, whom I mentioned a few moments ago. It is the notion that the exercise of reason can change the world. The term goddess is used with irony, but not lightly. From Descartes to the Enlightenment, and then to the French Revolution, we see a process in which reason became a substitute for religion. The French negotiator has the sense, perhaps partly subconsciously, of being possessed of what Alain Finkelkraut describes as the Cartesian project, whereby one makes oneself, through reason, master and possessor of nature. Moreover, the French are brought up to have an idea on everything and to express it with clarity. In ancient usage, this was known as the tradition of the honest man. This recalls the words of Madame Germaine, Germaine de Stal, and I quote, In all the classes in France, one senses the need to talk. Speech is not only, as elsewhere, a means of communicating ideas, sentiments, and business matters, but it is an instrument that one likes to play and which revives the spirit like music with some other peoples and strong liquor with others. There's a certain consistency in the way a French exposition proceeds. Ideas are laid out in a sequential fashion. A presentation must have a beginning, the development of the argument, and an end. The general theme is announced at the beginning. There follows a series of points, often three of them, in what is sometimes referred to as the sacrosanct division in three points. In the development of the argument, there may be, may be many detours along the way so that counter-arguments and paradoxes so dear to the French heart and which reflect the French focus on logic can be set forth. This is generally done in the framework of dialectical reasoning, making use of the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, chain of argument. There is a term for this style of presentation, and it is called dissertation, which in general means an exposition normally written on a point of doctrine or a learned question. The French dictionary de definition of dissertation is, quote, a written exercise that pupils in the upper classes of the lycées and those in the faculties of letters in the universities have to write on literary, philosophical, and historical subjects. In the last year of the lycée, tell me now, students have to take between seven and eight hours of philosophy each week, giving them ample opportunity to polish their craft of dissertation and ensuring 
that it becomes a prominent part of the intellectual baggage they will take with them should they enter the ranks of the French diplomatic elite. What is significant in this context is that this method of presentation is ingrained in French elites as far back as the years of the Lycée. According to Professor Von Tadden, whom I mentioned a moment ago, there is overall a French and Latin emphasis on form over content, quite the opposite of the Germanic style. For example, a Frenchman invited to a dinner takes pains over the packaging of the flowers he is to present to the hostess, l'emballage. In contrast to a German for whom the essential is the flowers themselves in their state of nature. Related to this is the fact that for the French, as with the ancient Greeks, there is a unity of the good and the beautiful. What is right can only be elegant and vice versa. A reflection of this penchant for elegance, which has such a bizarre ring in Anglo-Saxon ears, can be found in an article written by Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, the president of the European Convention, which put together a draft constitution for the European Union. Giscard described his experience on the convention as, quote, enchanting, and stated that he hoped the result would be a constitution that would be, among other things, lyrical. The educational background of the French, which includes a strong penchant for history, when combined with a certain Latinism that prefers audacity and panache and is impatient with Anglo-Saxon phlegm, produces a distinct French style, seizing the floor and speaking at length in the style of dissertation, finding the best solution based on reason and sticking to it, and if necessary, accepting the role of the odd man out, even to the extent of walking out of or boycotting negotiations. The negotiating style of the French has been described as positional. That is, they come to the table with a clear idea of what is to be their final position. This tends to mean, however, that the French are not prepared from the outset to come up with a fallback position. In other words, the French are not always readily flexible. The French do not mind being alone, where they can practice what is been called, what I referred to a few moments ago, as the burden of being right, and they can demonstrate what is called the French specificity. This characteristic is illustrated by an exchange during the 1980s between two arms control negotiators, neither of whom is known for a lack of outspokenness. When Stephen Ledegar of the American delegation observed to Benoit Dabouville, who is now the French ambassador to NATO, uh, Ledegar said, you're isolated, and Doubleville replied, wonderful, that's just the way we like it. <laughs> Yet, although the French negotiator becomes almost uniquely the holdout in European and transatlantic negotiations, in the end, a certain peasant realism, in counterpart to the tradition of bourgeois rationalism, which I've been describing, takes hold, and an agreement is often achieved. In this regard, it is worth noting Pierre Nora's evocation of the famous French solidity based, among other things, on, quote, the exceptional continu co continuity of national unity in spite of internal divisions and on a deep-rooted and tenacious peasant tradition. In the next to the last chapter in my book, I put forward some suggestions for those who wish to engage in productive negotiations with the French, and I'll mention a couple of them here. One of the headings in the chapter is recognize implicitness. In the negotiation literature, France is considered a high context country in which much is taking place that is not in the verbal exchanges themselves. Therefore, it is important to recognize the implicitness of things in dealing with the French. The American approach in the classic low context style is, I want to talk about such and such. The French approach, unstated, is, I want to know what's going on between the two of us. Another way of putting this is to picture a sliding scale between relationship and content. In other words, how much relationship does there have to be before you can get into content? The French view is that one will not get anything done unless there is a relationship established. 
The American attitude is indifferent to such a consideration and is reflected in an urge to get right down to the business at hand. As Raymond Cohen has put it, a high context culture communicates elusively rather than directly. As important as the explicit content of the message are the context in which it occurs, the surrounding nonverbal cues, and the hinted at nuances of meaning. In the low context culture, exemplified by the United States, what has to be said is stated explicitly. Indirection is much disliked. Straight from the shoulder talk is admired. Another negotiations expert, Fonce Tropenars, draws a distinction between high context and low context cultures in terms of operational implications for negotiations. According to Tropenars, and I quote, Context has to do with how much you have to know before effective communication can occur, how much shared knowledge is taken for granted by those in conversation with each other, how much reference there is to tacit common ground. Cultures with high context, like Japan and France, believe that strangers must be filled in before business can be properly discussed. Cultures with low context, like America and the Netherlands, believe that each stranger should share in rulemaking and the fewer initial structures there are, the better. Low context cultures tend to be adaptable and flexible. High context cultures are rich and subtle and may never be really comfortable for foreigners who are not fully assimilated. Westerners working for Japanese companies are never wholly inside. It is similarly hard to feel fully accepted within the richness of French culture with its thousands of diffuse connections." End quote. In the case of the French in particular, it is extremely important not to neglect empathy. The American negotiator should be a good listener as well as a good speaker. It is even more important to show that one is listening and that one gets the point of what the French are trying to say, even though there may not be an agreement in the end. Without empathy, Exchanges with the French are liable to be confrontational. Another theme in my chapter on suggestions for negotiators is that of multilateralism. There are two aspects of this. First, there is France's membership in the European Union. In many matters, especially trade, we are not dealing with France directly, but through the European Union. The second aspect is that since around the middle of the 1990s, France has developed a tactic of working through multilateral bodies such as the EU, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the United Nations, in part as a way to leverage its power vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Negotiators should expect, therefore, that the French will characteristically opt for multilateral solutions to international issues. Part and parcel of this multilateralism is a penchant for peaceful solutions to problems now that Europe has become solidly established as a zone of peace. This is not just a French phenomenon, but a Europe-wide phenomenon. The French want to be considered as a major power, and they want to be taken seriously. At the same time, they have an acute awareness that for most of the past 100 years, their country has not had the means to match its ambitions. The French should not be made to feel they are being slighted by the U.S. Behind a facade of certitude, the French are highly emotional, particularly in that they are quick to perceive slights. And often this happens with American pronouncements that are perceived merely as statements of fact and reflecting the U.S. position as the sole superpower. More generally, the French tend to be passionate about what they're doing, and thus they bring more emotion to the negotiating table. This passion factor should not be ignored. Americans for their part, should resist thinking reflexively about the French in terms of putative pretensions of grandeur, such as they're only doing this to increase their own prestige. Prestige, too, has a value, and externalities are important to the French. Just as the French individual has been brought up to have an opinion on everything, so France, as a collective identity, is in the habit of making policy pronouncements on a worldwide basis. Sometimes this comes across as pretentiousness, as France often does not have the power to influence events outside Europe. 
But the fact is that France looks upon itself as a major power with global influence, a residue of the syndrome of la grande nation that remains today in some form in the French outlook on the world. In closing, I would like to note that as one senior State Department official remarked to me, the French have the most cohesive and homogeneous foreign policy elite in the business. The view of this diplomat is echoed by that of Henry Kissinger, who rates French diplomatic officials as, quote, extremely able. I never met a French official who was not very bright, unquote. It all goes back, in Kissinger's view, to what he calls the terrific French educational system. I quote, there are two things about education, practical education and the training of the mind. It is life that produces practical education. The French emphasize the training of the mind. Thank you. Thank you. I would be happy to take some questions. Uh, whether on France and Iraq or France and the U.S. or whatever. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on whatever, do you have any, uh, you held very high position in the uh, Central Intelligence Agency. Do you have any uh, commentary about the bills uh, as the uh, Congress did? Well, I haven't seen the text, and I'd, I'd like to wait and see the text. Uh, I think it is largely a canard what the Pentagon is tried to say in the run-up to this vote that uh, this is going to interfere with getting intelligence to the troops in the field. The Pentagon wants to hold on to this 80% of the intelligence community budget that they control. And the 9-11 Commission recommendation is that the new super intelligence chief, the director of national intelligence, should have budgetary and personnel control over the whole intelligence community, including those agencies which are under the Pentagon, which are the National Reconnaissance Office, which puts the satellites up, the National Security Agency, which does the eavesdropping, and the, uh, whatever the new name is, it used to be called National Im uh, Imagery uh, and Mapping Agency, which uh, uh, does the uh, uh, photography and overhead imagery. These, these are all presently controlled by the Pentagon, and the 9-11 Commission wants the new Director of National Intelligence to control all these agencies, and, uh, and also in, in terms of budget and, and in terms of personnel. Uh, the Pentagon doesn't want this, and it would be interesting to see uh, what the compromise is in the text. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, there's some reference. Uh, in the compromise that uh, this Congressman Hunter accepted uh, to the effect that uh, this will not interfere with the uh, uh, chain of command going out to the warfighter, that is, President, Secretary of Defense, uh, Regional Command, Commander, whatever it is, and the uh, warfighter. Uh, basically, the Pentagon has a huge chunk of money. And, uh, again, I don't I'm not familiar with the details because I don't, haven't seen the bill, but the, the, the Pentagon has the privilege of uh, moving this money around. And uh, this, depending on the language, may or may not be taken away from them, from the Pentagon in some degree. Uh, personally, I think the 9-11 Commission did a wonderful job. It's a very, I'm sure many of you have read it, it's an immensely readable book. I mean, it just reads like a thriller because they had some historians in the, uh, on the staff, some very good ones. Uh, I think the Pentagon, uh, sorry, I think the 9-11 Commission, what they tried to do was to bring some centralization to the problem. They tried to replicate what happened in the Goldwater-Nichols reforms of the 1980s, which centralized the military services. They wanted to replicate that in the intelligence community which is very complicated because the intelligence community is made up of civilians and military. But I think the, uh, uh, the chief virtue of the 9-11 Commission report is that, it, first of all, it, 
it helps to cure the water's edge problem. That is, the division of labor between the FBI and the CIA. The CIA doesn't operate in the States. The FBI doesn't really rule things abroad. And this, this uh, director of national intelligence would, uh, would bring this together. Also, a director of national intelligence would uh, uh, rationalize the relationship between the military and CIA. Uh, one thing the 9-11 Commission recommended, which is not in the bill, is to turn over the paramilitary side of covert action to the Pentagon. Uh, this, uh, this was not included in the bill, as I understand it, but it is a recommendation that uh, is very important uh, if, it is, if it is carried through. The military, uh, they, have, uh, they have the guns. They have a lot of uh, capability. Uh, they haven't had the technique because uh, operating clandestinely abroad in the covert action context has always been the purview of the CIA through the mechanism of uh, a presidential finding which tells the CIA to do something in the action uh, sense. And uh, this is supervised by the intelligence committees of the Congress and, and the Senate. And the Pentagon, the military, want no part of any supervision by the intelligence committees of the two houses. They are connected with the armed forces committees and they wanted to keep it that way. And you notice that in the debate, it's the chairman of the armed forces committees, Mr. Hunter, and to a lesser degree, Senator Warner, who championed the military's position or the Pentagon's position. Yes. Well, I think France has had a very deep influence on uh, particularly their main preserve, which is black Africa. Uh, and you see it in the, uh, you see it in, in, the, uh, in the news reports on, on French radio, which I listen to every morning. Uh, the uh, African uh, leaders and diplomats, uh, they have, it's almost like a, an antique French style. They're very influenced by by the colonial past, and uh, it's not always favorable. We had a sudden revolt against the French presence in Ivory Coast, which is very shocking. Uh, but generally, uh, the French have had an enduring stamp on their uh, former colonial uh, peoples to a degree, I think, that uh, uh, no other empire has had. Uh, of course, the, the the Algerian experience is, is quite unique because uh, that has been such a deep scar on both sides that uh, it has never really uh, uh, amounted to a reconciliation. And there's, there's, a, there's a very uh, complex, both sides are very complex between the French and the Algerians, and it will, it will last. I don't know whether that answers your question, but we had another one over here. Yes. Well, uh, we all thought that the Cold War was over and there was going to be a new world order, I think George H.W. Bush said. And there were very severe budget cuts in the CIA. The recruitment of new officers, new uh, uh, career trainees, as they call them, was cut way back. That is true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's safe to say that uh, the CIA has never really mastered uh, the collection of human intelligence uh, 
in the Middle East uh, context. Uh, I think in this, with regard to the Iraq crisis, uh, to me the surprising thing was that not only did American intelligence get the weapons of mass destruction wrong, but this vaunted British MI6 with its decades and decades of experience in the Middle East, including Iraq, they didn't get it right either. And I think the answer is no high-level intelligence sources in Baghdad on the part of either service. Uh, but to come back to, again, your point, I think by the time of the late 1990s, uh, the CIA uh, was very uh, much on the TV about the threat represented by al-Qaeda. Uh, George Tenet, who I gather has just concluded a contract for a book, uh, he said to the, he made a me did a memo to the intelligence community principles in, I think it was early 1998, to the effect that we are at war with Al-Qaeda. So there was a high degree of consciousness about trying to do something about Al-Qaeda, and there's a very uh, uh, contentious book out by uh, a former CIA analyst who was the head of the bin Laden unit in the agency. It's called Imperial Hubris. And it details the lost opportunities to get bin Laden, some of which are uh, uh, detailed in the 9-11 report. Uh, there was one instance in particular where uh, a, I guess it was a UAE prince was visiting bin Laden at a farm outside of Kandahar, I think it was, and uh, uh, there was some concern over diplomatic relations with the UAE if this prince uh, bought the farm along with bin Laden. Uh, there were several other incidents of this kind described in, in this book. And uh, this is, of course, in the period of the Clinton administration. Uh, so there was, there was a certain frustration within uh, the CIA because there were some very good technical means of tracking, uh, uh, of tracking people in Al Qaeda while uh, through their communications, uh, it's called geolocation, and there's an interesting article by uh, Elsa Walsh, and I think it's, it's a recent New Yorker, concerning this new uh, uh, new number two or number three in the FBI. She's come over from. Uh, the NSA, which is the eavesdropping electronic surveillance, electronic intelligence uh, outfit. And I'd, uh, I'd recommend reading that, that article. It describes uh, in very general terms how this system can work, how you can identify where people are. And uh, according to this article, uh, it is claimed that uh, Atef, who was a military leader, and uh, Abu Zubeda, who was a very high uh, bin Laden functionary, were both, uh, uh, one was killed, the other was captured, both tracked by this geolocation system. Yes? Well, it depends what you mean by negotiations. Uh, certainly in the area of terrorism, there's a very close uh, cooperation. Uh, I think at the, uh, at the higher level, there's a certain inhibition uh, between the two uh, leaders. Uh, this notion that the French repeat that uh, Jacques Chirac was the first leader to visit the United States, first foreign leader to visit the United States uh, after 9-11 is a little bit misleading because the visit was already scheduled and uh, President Bush was not very impressed with uh, President Chirac. I think there's a certain uh, disconnect between the two of them. In a way, they're, they're quite alike. <laughs> they're quite alike. Uh, they're very action-oriented. They're very sort of uh, military in a way hard to say that in some ways, but in, in, at any rate, and they're both very touchy. Uh, you know, Chirac says some things that reflect this touchiness, like, 
uh, when the debate over Iraq took place, he said that these new Eastern European members of uh, NATO missed a good opportunity to shut up. And this caused a big uh, stir. And of course, uh, uh, they really, they, they had a meeting last May and they sort of patted each other on the shoulder, but it's, it's not there, it's not there yet. Uh, I think some of the, the, the diplomats work very hard at this. The ambassador in, in Washington is excellent and he's very visible and he, he uh, corrects some of these extreme uh, charges uh, against uh, France in, I think, a very effective way. And uh, I think there's a certain effort going on. The new foreign minister uh, is very different from his uh, predecessor, Mr. de Villepin, who uh, was very active on the world stage, as you will recall, in the UN. The new one at a uh, conference of French ambassadors, uh, Monsieur Balnier, said that we should become more modest in our approach to the world. The words to that effect, it was really quite, quite surprising. But there is an effort to, to, uh, to mute things. But I, I think that since these two leaders are going to be around until roughly 2007, maybe Chirac beyond that, I don't see uh, much prospect for a real uh, heartwarming relationship. Yes? Well, uh, Jacques Chirac has discovered China. He's emphasizing it to a great deal. Uh, I think there is a, uh, probably somebody in the room knows this better than me, there is a, uh, uh, an Alstom uh, contract pending for a uh, rail system in China. At any rate, the French are putting a big emphasis on this, but their actual percentage of trade with China is very low at the moment. But it is something that Chirac has taken to his, to his heart. Well, you know, uh, the French use this, uh, Chirac particularly uses this phrase, multipolarity, which uh, really raises hackles in Washington. I don't see why it should necessarily, but he is, uh, he is of the opinion that it's, it's not a healthy situation to have one overpowering superpower, and therefore uh, there should be a multipolar world, and I think the China opening is part of that. Uh, the, uh, the Russia thing has... Uh, has gone a little sour, especially in the last three weeks or so, because uh, the European Union and the U.S. Uh, for once are, uh, are really on the same wavelength about Ukraine, and uh, the Europeans are getting almost more criticism than we are by, by Putin. Uh, he said something very startling that uh, he didn't want, Ukraine, uh, didn't want Ukraine to be split up into two pieces like Germany is. It was, was a, it was a, it was more than that, but the, it was an unmistakable criticism of Germany. And, you know, in the Iraq war debate, uh, France, Germany, and uh, Russia were together uh, in opposition to the U.S. China really stays in the background in, in terms of U.N. Uh, matters. They, they don't like to get out in front. Yes, I see someone in the back. Well, uh, there's been a, certainly a change in uh, uh, outlook toward the world on the part of the French educational system and the French uh, uh, diplomats and officials. Uh, the emphasis on foreign languages is very strong now. Uh, that didn't used to be the case in the past. I think you have to have two foreign languages to be accepted into the École Nationale d'Administration. And you find the younger generation of French diplomats, you see them here in this country, their English is perfect. It's very different from, the, from times gone by. 
Uh, there's an effort to democratize uh, the École Nationale d'Administration. Uh, uh, it doesn't work very well, uh, but they, they're trying. They're trying to get more people from underprivileged backgrounds uh, in as candidates to, uh, to this, this finishing school for French officials. The problem is that uh, it is a stratified society in many ways. Uh, the, uh, the educated people, they learn a lot from within their own families. They go to the best lycées uh, and not the ones out in the suburbs. You know, in France, the suburbs are the, are the ghettos, unlike in this country. And uh, the, the lycées out there are not that good. So it's very hard to, uh, to break the structure of uh, the French uh, traditional, uh, traditional uh, culture. You find a number of diplomats, for example, who uh, they have been diplomats in the family for several generations. At the same time, the uh, exams are uh, administered in a very uh, uh, equitable way, very uh, strict way. So there is room for meritocracy, but there are certain traditional elements in the society that, that uh, tend to block this. But you do find, uh, you do, you do find a number of people from uh, modest backgrounds, but not in the sense of underprivileged. They're, pro they're people, uh, many of them are, are sons of teachers who, are, who have modest salaries, who come up through the pipeline and, and e emerge into the elite. So it's a combination of the two, it's a combination of a meritocracy and a slightly ossified, somewhat ossified uh, social structure. Yes. Well, I think the, the, uh, the verdict is mixed. Uh, there's a certain French bitterness, yes, but at the same time, uh, they, uh, they feel excluded by the Anglo-Saxon powers, that is Britain and America. They felt excluded after the first Gulf War, although they participated in it. In the second, the recent Iraq War, they were, or they said they were, ready to go. But then they, uh, they got the notion that the thing had already been decided, that the UN route was just a sham, and uh, they felt that they had been duped. So uh, I, I think, I think it, it, is, it is mixed. Uh, I, don't, I, I have an article that has just come out in French Politics, Culture, and Society, and it is called, it's par partly based on this case study in the book, it is called uh, The Iraq Crisis and France. Heaven sent opportunity or problem from hell, and I think uh, both elements are true. I mean, the French, uh, as uh, this famous uh, French philosopher Raymond Aron once remarked, this is not a direct quote, but it's the sense of it. The French are continually surprised by what they've just done, and he was saying this in relation to 1968, where suddenly the country was taken over by free lovers and students and anarchists and Maoists and it was just a shock to everybody. Are we uh, nearing the witching hour? Oh, there's a question here. And there's one over here. Just two, two left. No. no. No intelligence service had it right. Everybody fell on their face. Yes. Well, that's a very, uh, a very gripping question in France, you know, because France is a secular country, insistently secular and non-religious. 
And they don't, and the, the French school system reflects this French secularism, and they don't want any vestige of religion in the schools. And uh, here come these headscarves. And uh, there's a feminist angle to this as well, because uh, uh, the French uh, officials feel that there's a lot of intimidation going on, that the male members of the family are forcing these young girls to wear these scarves. On the other hand, there are some uh, young women who really want to wear the scarves. So the French have taken this uh, uh, extreme step of banning any religious, uh, ostentatious religious symbols in the schools because their outlook is very different from ours. They want to have a single model of a French citizen. It doesn't work in practice because in, in point of fact, France and the United States are not that dissimilar. We both have this multicultural problem. We accept it, perhaps to an extreme degree. The French reject it in favor of their single French model of secular citizenry. Uh, okay, one more. And then we have to uh, adjourn. Yes, go ahead, please. Well, what you say is absolutely correct. Uh, you know, France is uh, at base a Catholic country, although it has de-Christianized itself. But there's still, uh, I mean, you hardly see anybody in the church in France anymore. But you do see these religious schools. And uh, so there's a residue of feeling that uh, a religious education is a good thing. I mean, uh, people were raised by Jesuits, and I think de Gaulle was in a Jesuit. Lycée. So there's, uh, uh, I, I accept exactly what you say. There was a huge demonstration in the early 80s uh, over this issue of uh, uh, private schools, which meant mostly Catholic schools. And uh, uh, the, the, the upshot of it was that the French government subsidizes to the 85% of the cost of these Catholic schools. I don't know what the percentage is between those and the public schools, but of course there's a grand debate in, in France, you know between the Catholic residue and the secularists, and the secularists pretty much have triumphed through the revolution. Okay, thank you very much.